So you all heard that wonderful, beautiful voice. Okay, so um, welcome to session 3F at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Adrienne Kane, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the Assistant Director for the Institute for Oral History here at Baylor University, and I am pleased to be your session moderator today. There are some important guidelines and rules that we have to go through really quick, and I want to make sure I read them verbatim so I don't miss anything. So yes, I do have a handy sheet in front of me. All right, so for housekeeping, Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view our code of conduct on tdl.org, and I will be sure to also include that in the chat for you to review. So this session will run up until approximately 50 after the hour, so 2.50 if you are central. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. And I invite you again to all say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining from share your resources, and also to make comments throughout today's session. I'll be watching for your questions in the chat and share them with our speakers during the Q&A portion at the end. So the Q&A portion for both sessions will be at the end. So let's get this thing going. Are we ready? Okay, so now on with the show. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Karina Sanchez, who is the diversity resident librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. And the title of her presentation is Assessment Toolkit, Assessing and Advancing the Use of Open Education Resources. So I'm gonna hand things over to you, Karina, so we can get started. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Awesome. Okay. So I'm Karina Sanchez. I'm the diversity resident at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, I will be talking about an assessment toolkit created to help other open education fellows at UT Austin assess the, assess the impact of open education materials. I got to work closely with the assessment librarian and OER librarian to develop this plan. So this is an overview of my presentation. I'll be talking about the background, how the project came to be, um, research, the tool process of the toolkit development, and outcome and impact of the, this toolkit. So um, before I talk about the toolkit, I want to explain how I got involved and talk a little bit about the Open Education Fellows Program here at UT. So I'm a diversity resident um, librarian. It's a three-year position offered to early career librarians who come from historically underrepresented backgrounds. Um, during the first year of residency, I rotated around departments that I, uh, I'm rotating around de departments I'm interested in. Um, the rotations could be long-term, so for a few months or short-term um, for a month or two. Um, I decided to rotate in the assessment team and I got to work closely with the assessment librarian, uh, Maria Chochos. I wanted to learn more about the assessment process and understand how to create questions and goals for assessment and its potential impact in institutions like UT. One of the projects that Maria offered was to work on a toolkit that would allow me not only to understand the assessment process, but um, further learn about OER, which was one of my goals as well, um, being this residency ship. Now let's talk about the Open Education Fellows Program, which is currently in its first year and it's developed by our OER librarian, Ashley Morrison. This program's goal is to work with faculty to adopt and create open education resources, which aims to reduce cost of course materials for students and empowers instructors to use OER materials to meet their pedagogical goals. For more information about the fellows program, um, feel free to go to the research guide linked on my PowerPoint and um, we'll be posting it on the chat as well. Um, one of Ashley's 
goals for the fellows program was that the um, fellows that fellows conduct um, their own assessment, which they can use for their own research or help the library push OER. She reached out to Maria wanting to create tools that would uh, that would allow faculty to assess their classes. Uh, Maria presented this project as an option during my rotation, allowing me to take the lead on it. I took interest in it right away since it would hit two of my rotation goals, work with assessment and um, learn more about OER. My goal as a librarian is to further educational equity for students and researchers. So both assessment and OER do, do this. Assessment allows to see how programs, classes, um, tools are affecting students while OER is offering students free resources, allowing those who cannot afford, um, afford it to further their education, educational needs without um, impacting their finances. So now let's look into the research process. So once I began the project, I immediately began um, researching to see how other institutions use, um, institutions are assessing OER. Before doing OER research, I did research on assessment and I learned a lot from Maria before and during the project. What I first did when doing my OER research was um, look at into other institutions um, who also have OER fellow programs. I wanted to see if these um, uh, programs were requiring assessment and if they had any assessment published somewhere. I had no success in finding this information online, so I reached out to Ashley and see if she could get in contact with an institution. She reached out to an institution who did collect data from the fellows, but did not necessarily have these fellows work with the data. They did provide a lot of helpful um, resources and comments, and I kept that in mind as, I, as we were developing this toolkit. I continued to look into scholarly research and focus on their methodology section. Many focused on gathering data on financial, academic, teaching impact, and perception of OER. Luckily, many of these research studies provided uh, the assessment questions and results in their appendix, which we took, for instance, um, we took uh, as inspiration when creating um, the toolkit. And you can see one of the examples here on the left-hand side. Um, with the help of Maria, we looked at the examples and figured out the best focus for the OER fellows. And we decided that, that they're mostly going to look at data comparison and perception assessment. Now let's look into the development of um, the toolkit. Uh, the purpose of the toolkit is to provide an assessment guide and resources for faculty. I wanted to make sure that I described what assessment is and the purpose of it. Um, provide different methods that faculty could use on their research as well. Additionally, it was important for us that the toolkit made, toolkit made assessment for faculty as easy as possible. And I'll mention that again and again throughout the presentation. This is due to assessment being a requirement of the OER's fellows program. Staff needed to assess and analyze their assessment to fulfill their fellowship. Additionally, the faculty participating in this program have different levels of working and analyzing research data. Uh, therefore, making a toolkit that fits different levels of, of experience was needed. And the goal um, was to focus on those who are new to assessment. The toolkit has three areas, um, the assessment toolkit, the assessment worksheet and the Quadrix um, survey bank. And additionally, um, we created, um, well, Maria and Crystal, um, who is the head of assessment and communication, created a workshop uh, during April to go through the quantitative and qualitative analysis, um, which I'll talk about later on. Um, so first, let's talk about the assessment toolkit. Um, the toolkit introduces the fellows to an assessment to assessment resources that they can use and covers various topics, various topics which I'll go through. The first aspect is developing a plan. Um, this defines the purpose, purpose of assessment and the four points to focus, which are creating a research question, desired results, course measures, and recommendations. The worksheet we created dives into these topics, which I'll discuss later on in the presentation. The second point um, we mentioned was um, meeting with the UT assessment team. We recommended that if they had any issues creating goals or developing their questions to reach out to the assessment team. Um, we, wanted to, we wanted them to know that this was a resource available for them. The, type of, the third point is a type of course measures. Um, when developing an assessment plan, it was important for me to understand what OER programs usually want to assess and I was, as I was doing my research, I saw um, constant mention of the COUP framework. 
The Open Education Group has further details about the um, COUP framework. The framework looks at cost, which looks at data related to student savings, outcome, which compares impact and different measures of students, so usually compares student learning before and after OER implementation, usage and perception, how students are using open education materials and the view on these materials. These measures are assessed differently, so we decided to make a chart for the, for the faculty. So if they didn't know how to collect the data, we, we recommended tools. So you can see the chart here on the left-hand side. So for example, we have cost and outcome. So faculty will most likely use comparison data. So for cost, faculty will use campus textbook store data and see how buying textbook will cost compared to the OER material cost. And then for outcome, it will be grade comparison data. Um, so um, faculty would um, get grades from the previous semester and compare them to current or future semesters that are using um, OER materials um, and the previous semesters they're not, they weren't using OER materials. And then we have usage and perception that will most likely, um, faculty will most likely use surveys we recommended them to use a Qualtrics survey, um, and we recommended it because it's free for UT staff and faculty, and it is approved for classified data like HIPAA, FERPA, and IRB. Now staff plan to use a Qualtrics survey, um, some plan to use Google Form. Um, and then surveys are just important because it gives the students a way to localize their opinion on OER materials. The fourth section uh, that we included was uh, things to consider when crafting a survey. This section is, uh, provides tips on Qualtrics, type of language to use, such as keeping it simple and removing jargon, keeping the survey short, um, and being intentional when asking a question. And then we also included a reference. Um, we just included all the articles that I, we use as doing the uh, research, um, and also uh, mentioned that if they include survey uh, examples or not, in case faculty wanted to look at those examples and see what type of questions other researchers are asking. So now um, let's look at the worksheet that we created. The goal of the worksheet was to help faculty develop a research goal um, or question for their assessment. We also wanted to make sure that the developing a research question or goal was as easy as possible for faculty, since this is a difficult part of the process. Um, as I did some research, to see what was the best approach on creating the worksheet, I found a worksheet created by MSU Great Falls called How to Write Goals and Objectives for Outcome Assessment. Unfortunately, the institution took this worksheet down and I can't provide a link for it, but it did a great job in defining goals and um, including other terms that are needed when um, going through this uh, goal development process. Um, but let's look at the worksheet that um, we developed. So here it is. Um, I took this example to Maria and we began brainstorming, brainstorming the type of terms we, want, we wanted to use. Maria was a tremendous help um, in, in this um, since I personally struggled in figuring out what was the best method in helping research, research, researchers develop their goals. Also, having faculty create a goal for the assessment project is a tough task to tackle. And therefore the worksheet leads them and addresses things that should be considered as they create their question. Um, first, they needed to create a research question. Then they would need to create a desired result, which is um, identifying the criteria of the results. Then they would need to create um, a course measure, which, uh, which is basically a um, description of method and instruments for collecting the results. And then we added a, a things to keep in mind section. So for example, for the research question, we wanted faculty to be faculty to be clear, focused, concise, complex, and um, arguable. Um, for desired results, we wanted them to look, focus on um, what they want to accomplish, why they want to achieve the results, and how they would achieve the results. And then for course materials, we wanted them um, to look into who's involved, what type of data they will collect, and how they will measure the implementation of OER, and when they will collect the data. It was important that we broke down the three criteria that we wanted the faculty to focus on. This was to facilitate the planning process of the assessment for faculty, and it didn't leave them fully on their own. 
The faculty also had the option to meet with the assessment team if they needed the help developing their approach. They could have taken the worksheet um, fully done or partially done, and this gave the assessment team an idea on how to help them navigate this process. Um, also, uh, once they completed the worksheet, it also gave the um, Ashley, the OER librarian, a better idea on how far along the faculty is in their assessment process or when they're beginning that process. Lastly, as I was creating this worksheet, I was constantly thinking how busy faculty are and the limited time they have. So um, we created example questions for them. Um, and we knew that um, by providing example questions, it would influence the type of questions that faculty um, would create. So that's why I asked Ashley, um, what was the outcome of the, what was the outcome she wanted from the, or she wanted to look into from all of the OER fellow, fellow as the fellow program as a whole. Um, she wanted to understand the impact of OER students on students and their perception of the quality of OER. So you'll see the two examples here. Additionally, these were questions that were common that I found other researchers were asking as well. It was okay if faculty decided to copy these questions or develop their own and then look into assessing different areas of OER, not having to necessarily follow these examples. Lastly, even though this worksheet was created for OER use, it can be used for any type of assessment since it has what all assessment requires, a research question, desired results, and course measures. So it's open for all areas. The worksheet also helps to visualize, visualize the layout of this process, which is something I like about it. Now let's look into the Qualtrics survey bank. Um, again, we wanted to provide as much help for faculty, so we created a Qualtrics survey bank um, that will help guide faculty in figuring out what type of questions to ask. I referenced and used some questions from the articles that I found um, that had surveys attached. Additionally, from being a question bank, it provides instructions on how to create a survey through Qualtrics. Um, it went over uh, different tools like Skip Logic, um, which allows researchers to ask yes or no questions, um, which will direct them to certain questions depending on their answer, or using different question formats like um, response boxes or Likert questions. And we have an example of it down here. The questions mostly focus on demographic cost, perception, and usability, and provided examples of different types of ways to ask these questions. Fellows can copy these questions and put them in their own survey or can you just follow the instructions on how to create a Qualtrics survey. Um, therefore, creating an easy ass assessment process for them, which was the goal. Then we had a workshop. Um, the assessment team offered a hands-on workshop for faculty who needed help in analyzing their da data. The workshop took place last month in April. So by that time, most staff already had their assessment goals or research question kind of figured out or partially figured out. Maria and the head of assessment communication, Crystal Wyatt Baxter, took lead on these in this workshop. Ashley sent out a survey to under, uh, sent out a survey to faculty to understand what they would like from the workshop and what they would want the workshop to cover. Um, many of the needs had similar aspects. Um, therefore, Maria and Crystal decided to review um, how to work with quantitative and qual qualitative data. Faculty were not required to attend, but many did since some faculty felt that an uh, overview and analyzing the data would be helpful. Uh, Crystal looked into quantitative data and showed faculty how to export data into Excel, clean, um, clean up data, and go through the analysis process of it. While Maria covered um, qualitative data, she covered coding, grouping, and describing data. A set of quality data was created from the example questions from Qualtrics Bank um, that faculty used to practice. So they were giving the, the outcomes of this Qualtrics survey bank. And um, as Maria went through her example, faculty were able to follow on and go through um, the process itself of analyzing quality um, data. As I watched the presentation, faculty were interested in learning, participating, participated, and asked questions. We feared that 
um, the session wouldn't be helpful since we thought that a lot of them might have um, known how to do this already, but it turned out to be really helpful and I learned a lot from it as well. Assessing programs like OER, OER is vital to promote equity in university campuses that tend not to benefit minority students. As librarians, we need to support these programs and make sure that libraries sustain, sustain them. Therefore, assessment creates visual da data that administrators can see the impact. Assessment is a vital tool and skill to have. Luckily, a big institution like UT Austin that is well-funded can have its own assessment team but many smaller institutions do not have this advantage in access to assessment. So a librarian working in a smaller institution um, might need to focus on assessment, but they're not an expert. So they need, to, they need to figure out where to even start. Therefore, a toolkit like the um, assessment toolkit facilitates assessment and it's beneficial not only to faculty, but librarians trying to um, better their library resources and library overall. Therefore, the OER toolkit has been published to OER Commons that is accessible for anyone and can be edited. I hope that this toolkit is used to continue to assess OER by other institutions and that the worksheet is used by anyone who needs, um, who is in need of assessing their institution to advocate for equ equitable needs. Also, I'm glad that I was given the chance to take a lead on this project. I learned a lot from assessment and OER librarians. And these are skills I can use a lot, utilize as I complete my residency ship at UT and for future institutions I might work with. To conclude, assessment is needed to support equitable, equitable programs like OER. It facilitates big changes that we need to make in institutions that are hard to change because of their, their lengthy history. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation, Karina. And slight little segue there. When we're talking about surveys, for those of you who have not received a survey yet for this conference, I'm putting it right now in the chat. This survey really helps us to develop better programming or to make improvements for next year. So when you get a chance, please make sure that you take that survey. All righty, so let me go ahead and let's get ready for our next presentation. So our next presentation for this session will be given by a group of OER practitioners from the UT system and is titled Opening Up a Community of Practice. So I'll let y'all go ahead and get started. Thank you very much and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This presentation is about a community of practice that the UT systems OER practitioners have formed. We'll talk about how we did it and what we've been able to get out of it so far and give a few tips for people who are interested in starting their own group. Before we start, we'll go around and introduce ourselves. My name is Jessica McLean. I am the director of OER at UT Arlington. Hi everybody, my name is Gabby Hernandez and I am the open education librarian at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Morrison and I'm the Talker Open Education Librarian at UT Austin. The Archivist and Scholarly Communication Librarian at UT Tyler. And I'm Tessie Torres, I'm the OER Librarian at UT El Paso. Great. So if we can go to the next slide, please, I'm going to start with some background about our group and the institutions that we represent to give a little context as to why this group uh, is so important to us. The UT system is made up of 13 institutions across the state, and our group specifically is made up of members who represent the eight academic institutions. The other five are health sciences institutions. In addition to the speakers that just introduced themselves, we also have members in our group from UTSA, UT Permian Basin, and UT Dallas. Across the UT system, there are almost 243,000 students, and almost half of all undergraduate degrees are awarded to students who qualify for a Pell Grant based on financial need while enrolled at a UT institution. So OER initiatives are a priority for the system, as well as for our individual institutions, and we've received a lot of support so far at the system level. While we have the system in common, we also vary in a lot of ways. We're located throughout the state geographically, and we have a wide range of enrollment numbers. Our smallest institution is UT Permian Basin, and our largest is UT Austin. Among us, there are five Hispanic serving institutions, and our institutions include M1, R2, and R1 classifications. 
These differences in our institutions and in our histories of institutional support mean that we're also in different places when it comes to our OER program development. Uh, for example, our staffing models for OER initiatives can vary a lot. Some of our institutions have one or more staff members who work on OER projects, but only as part of their job duties. That would include UT Tyler, UT Permian Basin, and UTSA. For other institutions, we have at least one full-time staff member whose primary responsibility is OER. So that would include UT El Paso, UT Austin, UT RGV, UT Dallas, and UT Arlington. Within the group, we also have a wide range of personal professional experience in this area. Some of my colleagues have years of experience doing this work, while others like myself have only been in our positions for a very short amount of time. I've been at UT Arlington for about seven months now. And I think these differences are part of what makes the group so valuable. We all have similar goals in supporting OER projects and student success initiatives, but the way that we approach our work by the nature of our situation is very different. So I think having a variety of perspectives is really important within the group. Next slide, please. So to talk a little bit about how this all got started, um, in April of 2019, the UT system convened the Affordable Learning Accelerator Task Force. And this large group of varying types of stakeholders discussed ways to support and accelerate institutional efforts to expand the availability and affordability of high quality, low or no cost instructional and learning resources. This task force began the system's momentum of raising awareness and focusing on the importance of textbook affordability across the system. And a set of recommendations was created to ensure textbook affordability would be integrated into the system's success frameworks. And like Jessica said, during this time at the campus level, there were some UT system librarians who had well established affordability programs and were OER leaders in Texas and beyond. Other campuses were beginning to create dedicated librarian positions um, to carry out this momentum and other institutions did not have the capacity to hire new librarians and were adding textbook affordability work as a side task to some already overflowing workloads. Some UT librarians were familiar with each other and working together formally through different external organizational initiatives, and others, such as Ashley and myself, were meeting informally monthly to talk about our positions and workflows. Both of us were hired at almost the same time as open education librarians, which was a newly created role at both of our separate institutions. And during these monthly meetings, we realized how beneficial it was to toss ideas around and to speak to someone who could relate to the similar work tasks um, and share resources. And these quickly became my favorite meetings because I was able to connect with someone who could understand and relate to the challenges and successes of our work. And during one of our sessions, we talked about how wonderful it would be to formally meet all the other UT system OER practitioners and see if they would also want to join in on the discussions. Ashley had already been in contact with most of the practitioners uh, and really led the charge of discovering who else was dedicated to this work within the system. So we decided to send an email out to all the people who worked with OER in a UT system library, whether it was in their job title or not. And we formally invited them to an informal virtual meet and greet. And what we really wanted to connect the people who were tasked with implementing the OER momentum throughout the system. And we hoped that we could break down the silos of our work while simultaneously supporting and learning from each other. This initial meeting evolved into a recurring meeting every six weeks where we can all come together if we have the time and the capacity to discuss our needs, both personally and professionally as UT system OER practitioners. Next slide. There we go. So what is it that we actually do when we meet? Um, at the informal meetings that Gabby mentioned, we're able to cover a lot of variety in topics because we have a completely open agenda. Um, what that means is that anyone can add discussion topics to the running Google document that we keep at any time. And we also respond to timely needs or ad hoc requests within meetings. 
Typically, our meetings do start with a little bit of round robin where we each share updates, wins, or challenges related to our OER responsibilities. Um, sometimes it's just commiseration. Uh, including and beyond those updates, most of what we talk about boils down to projects, partners, and practices. So a type of project um, that we frequently discuss is faculty programming, and specifically those that involve grants, awards, or stipends to support OER adoption or development. And some of our institutions, um, like others have said, have been running programs like these for many years and have really established processes. And others of us, like me, are new to them or are just in the consideration or planning stage. But we always have a lot to share and learn from one another on this topic. Among our group, we also create lots and lots of documentation and assets that we're willing to share with one another in the spirit of open education. Um, this includes things like libguides, OER websites, instructions, and graphics that we use to support our programs and choose to openly license and share with others. Uh, these tools allow us to avoid recreating the wheel in some cases. So partners, while some of our responsibilities are 100% OER, as you heard, and for some of us, it's just a fraction of our job duties, we all rely heavily on partnerships of different kinds to advance OER awareness and adoption on our campus. For example, most of us have OER working groups or task forces, and we share best practices for developing and coordinating those groups. We also talk a lot about our bookstore partnerships because they're so crucial to OER and other textbook affordability initiatives. And some of us, we've found, have the same vendors for our bookstores, so it's been really helpful to share best practices for working with them and get the reporting that we need. Other practices we discuss are related to our ongoing operations and programming. Assessment is definitely a hot topic for us. Um, in one of our very first meetings, we each shared our approaches to measuring cost savings and ROI of our various OER initiatives. And while none of us do this the exact same way, it was really helpful to hear about why we choose to do things the way that we do when it comes to assessment and measurement. And at our last meeting, we also had a really great discussion about why we might want to focus on measurements beyond cost savings, like grades and other student success metrics. Recently, we also surfaced funding as a future discussion topic. We're really curious about how each of us fund our programs or even our own jobs in some cases. And we anticipate that hearing how others do this might help us be strategic in seeking campus funding, grants, or reaching out to potential donors through development efforts. And I mentioned earlier that sometimes we need to respond to timely topics, and one that's consumed a lot of each of our time individually lately is responding to mandates uh, that relate to OER and course materials. For example, state legislation from a few years ago required our institutions to implement course markings for OER, but this legislation and other mandates like it are often not very prescriptive in the ways that they must be implemented. Um, and this happened again really recently with another bill that related to inclusive access, um, which a lot of us also focus on in addition to our OER responsibilities. Um, and we reacted by devoting a sig significant amount of our meeting time sharing how each of our campuses were reacting to that. And I should mention, by the way, that if this particular topic is one you're interested in, there's a roundtable all about responding to legislative mandates on Thursday morning, so you should attend that. But that's a little bit about what we discuss when we get together. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about some feedback and experiences that we collected from um, the members of our OER practitioner group. Um, as we've kind of already touched on, um, these meetings are about learning from each other and supporting each other. Um, we all share the same hope of breaking down uh, barriers of affordability and accessibility for students, and it's the same model we bring into these meetings, um, an opportunity to freely share resources and make our OER initiatives better at each of our institutions. So everyone in our group agrees that uh, it's a great uh, place for sharing materials, ideas, and give updates on what other schools are doing. And it's a really comfortable uh, setting to discuss our programs, probably because it is formally informal. Uh, we 
so for us, it's, it's more than just networking because we each have an opportunity. Um, we each have opportunities and constraints within our own system and within Texas legislation. Um, as Ashley shared, we've been having conversations about how each institution is dealing with course markings, uh, legislation related to inclusive access models and things like that. And as Jessica said, we have a wide range of experiences related to working on OER. So our librarians who are running well-established OER programs, they have financial support, um, they've been able to navigate new legislation, they're eager to share their experiences and documentation so that we can all succeed. Um, this way, those of us like at my institution um, who aren't as far along in these programs, um, we all are part of a supportive group and we're all working toward the same goal. Um, but we don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel or recreate all the programming on our own. We can reply on, uh, on our, our other practitioners. Um, this group, uh, as we briefly said, is also a direct line uh, to discuss setbacks and frustrations. Uh, it is really great to regularly check in with people who get it and people who are experiencing the day-to-day -day highs and lows of working toward um, successful OER programs on our campuses. And for me and for others in this group, um, working with OER is not our primary role. So it's beneficial for us to just set aside the time to keep up to date on what's happening with OER in general and also within UT system. It, it really has been a good source to help us advocate to our administra administrations um, to be able to reference specifically what other schools are doing and that we're having these conversations together um, to further UT system institutions as a whole. Uh, and lastly, I'll, I'll just say our colleague from UT Dallas probably said it best. Um, instead of feeling alone and like we're the only librarian working toward more, more OER support on, on our campus, we have our group and we kind of have our tribe and we're all helping to further each other's efforts. So I will be talking about how sustainable this group is. Uh, we do have a very flexible model. So as you've heard throughout the presentation, it's very casual, it's very informal. So that means that we can pop in when our schedule allows and we don't feel constrained or uh, rushed. Um, meetings are not required or mandatory. It's not required by the UT system, um, by our deans or directors. Um, so again, we can uh, pop in when we can, pop out if we need to. Like Ashley mentioned, our agenda frequently adapts to cover the constantly changing landscape that is the world of OER to include legislation, um, anything that comes our way, we can talk about it. And something else that makes it very easy to join is because of the pandemic, we've all gotten very comfortable with Zoom and other online meetings. So um, because we're comfortable with the medium, uh, again, very easy to join. So this so far has kept our group sustainable. Uh, I think we've all expressed interest in keeping this model. I don't think any of us feel the need to make it more formal because as informal as it is, it definitely works for us. And, and I certainly feel um, inclined to join in because of how informal it is. A benefit to sustaining the group is connections to sister schools uh, in the UT system. Uh, I joined UTEP um, in January of 2021, and I did feel a little lost in my OER skills ever since joining this group in November. I definitely feel more connected to uh, the outside. Uh, El Paso is very far away from the rest of the schools. So having some connection to the rest of the UT system uh, definitely makes me feel closer. And then we also crowdsource ideas. So because of our varying experiences with OER, um, someone more experienced could have best practices or someone who is new and fresh could have something invigorating uh, for the group to utilize. Next slide, please. So looking forward in our future meetings, we 
do plan on um, meeting uh, in this highly flexible model as the support system. And hopefully, uh, when it is safe to do so, uh, we all plan on meeting in person one day um, just to actually uh, spend time together. We do have some advice if you're looking to start a community of practice. Uh, the biggest hurdle to overcome is reaching out. And so don't be scared. Go ahead and, and send that email, make that phone call, send that Teams message. Uh, however is best for you to reach out, do it. Um, it's as simple as a quick line. Um, it doesn't have to be this long thought out um, message. It could be just a quick hello, introducing yourself and, and why you'd like to start that community of practice. It is relatively low stakes. Um, when I got the email from Ashley and Gabby, it was very short, but very welcoming. Uh, so low stakes, and we are all reaping the rewards across the UT system by joining in. And so we do have our contact information up here. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we do have the momentum on OER from the UT system. Uh, that's going to outline all our institutions' um, goals and what we've been doing in OER, as well as our individual contact information. And that's it for us. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Thank y'all so much. That was really exciting and really interesting to see how you've developed this community. Um, so now we're going to get into Q&A and I will selfishly start. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will get to them. Um, so in developing this toolkit, Karina, or for the community of practice, I was just curious, is there anything that you were just super adamant about having or doing that you realized wasn't really important in the end or vice versa, something that you were just like, oh, we'll go with it. But then you realize like, mm, we need to put some more emphasis on this. Um, I'll go with one, which was we set up initially, so we had our first meeting, and then I want to say that we put four recurring meetings, so for every six weeks, and we were like, oh yeah, that's like plenty, that's super long, and then all four of them happened, and then I had this idea, and I was like, oh, I need to talk to the other OER practitioners about this, and I looked to put it like in my notes for the next session, and then realized there weren't any other sessions like we had run out and I was like, how did this already happen? Like it felt like we just started. So one thing that we probably should have put more emphasis on was like making sure like that's going to happen long term because before you know it, like the time passes and then and then it's so easy once it falls off that calendar for like three, four or five weeks to go. And then you're like, oh, wait, I, I miss I miss my OER friends. Where did they go? <laughs> so uh, that was one thing that we probably should have put some more emphasis on in the beginning, um, but a good problem to have. Karina, was there anything in particular that you would like to share? Yeah, sorry, my internet's kind of slow, so hopefully I don't get cut out, but um, I think the workshop, um, I, I didn't develop it, but during the process, um, can, you, can you guys hear me? Sorry about that. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, yeah, the workshop. So during the process, um, we were talking about the workshop and uh, we didn't have full agreement on it because we didn't know the level of skills that the faculty had um, and we thought it was going to be just too repetitive for them. Um, but I know that the Maria and Ashley and I just we really wanted to do it. Um, we felt like it was important. I was happy that we were able to advocate and do the workshop because it went through a lot of things that um, I think they're not it's not always considered. Um, but yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, so we have a question coming from the chat. Um, and I will ask, I believe it's Leah or Leah, could you, um, is this for everyone or was it for a specific group? It was, it was just a general question. I know that it was mentioned earlier. So I was just wondering if you, if I could just get a little more information about like how open access plays. Okay. And the question just to reiterate was, can you talk a little more about open access, specifically books? Yes. I can try um, as a scholarly communication person. So one of the issues we have uh, sometimes at UT Tyler is faculty who want to use OER, but what they end up finding are open access books. So the primary difference be being the licensing. So with an OER, it has to be adaptable. You have to be able to remix it, change it, break it up, share it in different ways versus an open access material where you can use it for free, but you might not have the copyright license that allows you to pull out chapters, change chapters, remix it, move it around with other things. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of the distinction between OER and open access as it relates to, to most scholarly output. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. And then, I, and then uh, someone mentioned earlier that that that's like one of the things you're working on in addition to like OERs also open access. A lot of the same librarians would be working on both. Yeah, so in my position, I, I do both. I do more related to open access initiatives on campus. Um, essentially, you know, they're very similar. Most scholarly communication librarians probably do a little bit of both. I think uh, the majority of my co-presenters focus primarily on OER, um, but they are interrelated for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Gabby just put a really helpful link in the chat or an infographic that um, helps distinguish between the two. So thank you for that, Gabby. All right. Are there any additional questions? Feel free to put in the chat or or a small enough group, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Just have a moment of awkward silence and it's okay. <laughs> Okay, well, what we can do um, in my true oral historian fashion, if there's anything that um, either of you presenters would like to add is just a one more thing, one more uh, bit of info about your projects or your experience, uh, feel free to at this moment. There's just one burning thing that maybe you didn't get to mention that you would like to add. Uh, well, just I'll just go ahead and reiterate that just just try it, just jump in there and try to open a community of practice. Uh, it's really become one of my favorite things. I truly enjoy uh, meeting and being able to be with all of these people who are working towards the same thing. Uh, I feel like we're friends and we have shared both personal highs and lows and struggles and you know, you kind of know that you have somebody there to just like also check in on you. Like if, you know, you, you heard something that they might've shared that was really, really hard. And then knowing that somebody just sends you an email just to check in, um, it feels really great. And to know you have that lifeline out there. So it is a little, a little awkward to just like start the high, can, can we meet? But I, I have found it super beneficial. So try it. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. And Karina, I have one more question for you, not to put you on the spot. So <laughs> you were saying that um, the worksheet that you developed, that it could be used in other forms or for other means. Have you seen it used in a different way yet? And if so, how was it used? 
Um, I haven't seen it used in a different way yet, but I know that the assessment librarian plans to keep that form and use it for any future assessment consultations you may have. Um, so I'll reach out to her eventually and see if that form was to any use. So I, I hope it works, you know, and I'm happy it's an OER common. So if anybody needs to do assessment, um, there's a worksheet that explains how to go through that process well. Awesome. Well, everyone, we are just about at 50 after, probably 11 seconds from it. But I would like to thank you all for participating and joining in in today's session. I also want to thank all of our presenters. Thank you so much for taking the time to develop this and to present this. I know it's been a lot of work, but you all are doing great work. And I'm so excited for the future of your community and your toolkit. So um, thank you all again for participating. And we'll see you tomorrow. Is there one more session? I'm going to be quick talking because I'll get myself in trouble. We'll see you along the conference. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>